Hello. It's about 1 a.m. on East Coast time, and I spent the last four hours <coughs> uh, ministering, tending, listening to people feeling uh, desperate, anxious, worried, guilty, ashamed, angry, sad, confused, etc. I would say in the last four hours it's been about 19 different people that I'm kind of juggling. Um, messages on various platforms with, you know, all private. Uh, of course, I can't reach out physically to hug everybody. I'm hearing stories about people thinking about what they can set on fire, how much they can drink, where they can hide, where they can move, uh, what they can stockpile, that sort of thing. So I thought I would join you from where I think a lot of you may end up, and that is uh, curled up in your shower. <laughs> so I thought I'd curl up in my shower uh, in, I don't know, solidarity or something. And um, I haven't spoken about politics since I've had this Facebook account on this account generally, not in person either. Don't intend to now. I will remind everybody that if your anxiety, worry, anger, fear, etc., has um, come to fruit before any decisions have actually been made, then you're premature in your worry. I suggest a deep breath, some constructive tend tending to your own body, heart, mind, those around you. Reach out, stay connected, breathe. If indeed for you, there comes soon a time for grief, then it's natural to engage in that grieving. And we'll be the, all the more connected uh, and able to support one another. So, for tonight, don't start drinking, don't eat all of the chocolate, try and get some sleep, hydrate, rest, read something good to yourself before bed. When you wake, you'll see what the world brings. When you wake, you'll see what the morning brings. When you wake, you'll see what the world has wrought. And it'll all be okay. And it'll all not be okay. And that is okay. So, I think I'll read some poetry. And I picked up Red Pine. Uh, just so adore this title. Clouds should know, be my now, know me by now. And so, if you'd like, you can crawl underneath your bed, or underneath the back porch, or hide in the back seat of the truck that doesn't work that's in your garage, or join me in your shower. There I am. And let's see if I can hold the phone here, sort of by my foot. See how, see how that works. Love. So this is The Cloud Should Know Me By Now, Buddhist poet monks of China. This is edited by Brad Pine and Mike O'Connor. This is Up After Illness, 
I watch the idle clouds. Up after illness, I watch the idle clouds crowding together in the sky, then parting, pausing long enough to laugh at me. I could never match your twists and turnings. Colliding with rocks, you leave no trace. Obeying the wind, you seem to have ears. This mountain of the immortals has phoenixes enough. Better be off to flock with your own kind. That was up after illness. I watched the idle clouds. And now for another random. That one seems a little long. Okay. This is called Living in Poverty. Page 99 if you're playing the home game. I just thought I should maybe have recorded this in a bomb shelter that's downstairs. Maybe that would have been funnier. <laughs> <laughs> More apropos. This is Living in Poverty. By Chiyuan. The stove in my mountain kitchen is tracked with blue moss. Dust fills the alms bowl. There isn't any food. A pity. Mice and sparrows haven't learned about poverty yet. Drilling into the room, drilling through the walls. that the audio is pretty horrible here in the shower but there's still more to read so I'll just change my perspective a little bit I'll try it this way see how we do hopefully I don't press the end button by mistake. I apologize in advance for all of my very many mess-ups. Well, that's how the hopeful wants to be, so I mean, I probably look cool doing that. Don't say I don't. <laughs> I'm imagining bubbles up to here. So... This is from Huai Ku, page 96. Huai Ku wrote this poem called Living at a Monastery, sent to Qian Chang. <clears throat> Snow collects on East Mountain Monastery. Deep in the mountains, few people come and go. Without daydreams, about red dust in the pale sun. I'm peacefully at ease or among moss and flowers with a staff and clogs or in the wooded shadow near an incense lamp. 
What's the need to fly away on your walking stick again? Come back as a recluse to Mount Wochal. There's a line in there without daydreams about red dust in the pale sun. I'm peacefully at ease or among moss and flowers of the staff and clogs or in the wooded shadow near an incense lamp. That red dust is a recurring phrase in some of the Chinese classics. That red dust is it's the daily mundanities. It's the filth of the world. It is What covers and coats us? When we don't tend to ourselves, when we're still, when we lose our discipline. So that red dust is what gets shaken off, what gets cleaned off, what gets smudged away what gets purified so the story is that or a story is that you know the sage will you know climb up you know to the mountain top to the you know mountain cave and go through all their ceremonies and their way of being and their way of chanting and their way of writing and their way of living with nature, with very, 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 very few possessions. You know, so when we think of a sage, just they seem to do everything right, we do everything wrong. They know all the answers, we don't even know the questions. Uh, they're the teachers, we're the students at best. But even that sage, you know, if they walk down the mountain, you know, which of course is a metaphor for kind of losing sight of their discipline, and they come into the world that we know, they accumulate their red dust. In other words, the dust falls on everybody. It collects on everybody. It cakes on everybody. The reason we don't see the sage as covered in red dust is that they do keep to their discipline, they do keep to their principles, they do keep to their way. And so if this sage comes down the mountain who, let's say, has been up there for 60 years, so they're a, they're a saint, they're a godhead, they're, you know, a guru, they're songs about them and, you know, supplicants and <laughs> acolytes and so forth that follow them, if they just come into the regular world for a short bit, they'll be covered in red dust. And so even that day, that day's walk, you know, the lesson is that they need to continue to cleanse, to release, to forgive, to have their practice, to become clean, we don't mean morally clean, that's not the idea here. But free of a fractured view. So, uh, 
when I hear uh, KD talk about, uh, it's a really great way of saying it, about grace. It makes me think of red dust, the same as he talks about grace. He says, you know, it's, it's, it's a story he tells, but it's a story that he tells of having heard been told to him. So anyway, it's a few steps away from me, but I'll tell it the way he tells it, as if I'm him. After my 1.30 in the morning yawn, sorry. He said, he was told that, you know, why do some people receive grace and others don't? And the Guru said, well, grace is there for everyone. It's like rain constantly falling, constantly a gentle, nourishing, warm, welcome, life-giving, cleansing rain. All the time, always, for everyone, everywhere, there's constant grace. And so the question was, well, why do some people receive grace and some people don't? And the answer was that you have but to hold your hand out. To receive the grace. And without this, it's raining all around, but you've collected none. And of course, this is a metaphor for the practice, for the discipline. But when I hear that, I think about the red dust idea, right? I think about that idea that the red dust is also always coming down on everyone, everywhere, always. So, since I'm talking about the red dust, I'll read this again. Living on a monastery sent to Chinchang. Snow collects on East Mountain Monastery. Deep in the mountains, few people come and go. Without daydreams about red dust in the pale sun, I'm peacefully at ease, or among moss and flowers with a staff and clogs, or in the wooded shadow near an incense lamp. What's the need to fly away on your walking stick again? Come back as a recluse to Mount Wojul. And that's by Huai Kul, page 96. So I may as well say, please feel free to reach out to me in your personal channels that many of you, most of you may have Facebook Messenger, text message email uh, we're happy to help you get through what you feel you're going through but for now, tonight coming to you live from a shower somewhere that has not been renovated. <laughs> we have poetry from the bathtub, a new web series that's been already canceled. <laughs> so this is page 35 from The Cloud Should Know Me By Now. This is a Red Pine and Mike O'Connor. I don't think this, yeah, this is a one page. This is Auspicious Arrival of Yung Tao. This morning, laughing together, just a few such days in a hundred. After birds pass over Sword Gate, it's calm. Invaders from the south have withdrawn to the Lu River wilds. We walk on frosted ground, praising chrysanthemums bordering fields. Sit on the east edge of the woods, waiting for the moon to rise. Not having to be alone is happiness. We do not talk of failure or success. Oh. 
shift you into a slightly different view. I don't know if it makes any difference at all, but it allows me to get credit as a cinematographer. And that's very important because my IMDB just has me as a stunt double for extras. So feel free to join from your own dystopian corner of your home. That was page 35, the last one, if I hadn't said that. On page 28, this is Meng Jung gainfully unemployed. <laughs> Meng Jung gainfully unemployed. Your residence, Meng, overlooks the river, but you do not eat the fish in it. Your robe is common, sewn of coarse cloth. Silk books alone fill your bamboo shelves. The solitary bird loves the wood. Your heart also not of the world. You plan to row away in a lone boat and build another hut. In which mountains? So that, uh, that little stanza, you plan to row away in a lone boat and build another hut. That brings to mind a, a story about an empty boat. It's a teaching story. I think uh, Osho had a book called The Empty Boat, I think. I think it was called Empty Boat, The Empty Boat, probably. Of course, based on the story of The Empty Boat. So, I'll tell you that story. This would be uh, far more comical and probably much shorter lived video if I turn the shower on. <laughs> Not only the electronics, but the book would be ruined. <laughs> I suppose. So the story of the empty boat. Uh, the Empty Boat is a is a meditation I teach as well. Uh, we're going to uh, lead people through the story of it in, in their minds. They're very present for it. But I'll tell you the story. So you set out on your rowboat, tied up at the edge of your shore in the early morning 
you know, the sun hasn't come up and it's foggy besides, but oh, to be on that wooden boat with the particular creakings, the particular sloshings in the water, when nobody else is around, a few people are awake, nobody knows you're there. I mean, for God's sakes, the fish are asleep. So you get into the creaky rowboat. And they're rowing out, you know. And it's quiet. You can hear the water lapping against the sides of the boat. You may hear a bird call, you may feel the wind die down or pick up, and boy, you know, that is just perfect. Cell phones haven't been invented or thought to be invented yet. Nobody knows you're here. There is nobody else here that's around this part of the lake, or this lake at all. Nobody's awake. Planes haven't been invented, nobody's flying over. It's just quiet, it's just nature, and a boat, and you. And your heart opens to the day. And you could feel the cool mist on your skin. And then, your boat collides with somebody's boat. Another boat just collides, shattering this lyric, beauteous, peaceful moment. I mean, what kind of an idiot would be out there without a lamp, without calling out? And anyway, who who is it that's on your lake? So you can imagine the anger, the surprise, the frustration with the other boat owner. I mean, somebody could have been hurt. Your boat's probably damaged. And anyway, your mood has been shattered. So probably a curse word or 12 comes out. I mean, you're a sailor, after all. And you throw a line, and you grab at the other boat to see who's damaged and how. And you slowly realize through the dark and the mist that the other boat was empty. It was just an abandoned boat it was afloat, just like your boat. And they happened to bump into one another. And so in that moment, there's no anger. There's no frustration. There's no need for swearing. There's no thoughts of vengeance. There's probably laughter, or SMH. Because it's an empty boat. Now, if the boat had had somebody in it, or another pilot, he would have been angry and had words, which may have elicited their angered words in return. And at the end of that, what you have to do is row back to shore and repair your boat, which is going to cost you whatever it's going to cost you, money, time, materials. So there's a, there's a fixed cost of finance, frustration, time to repair the boat. 
Now, at the moment that you run into the other boat, that has no pilot. It's just a floating boat, abandoned, lost, whatever. You have the same fixed costs, the same repair bill, the same time to repair, the same need to row back to your shore to fix the boat. But there's no anger, there's no insult, there's no argument, there's no blame. There might just be laughter, like what are the odds? And so the lesson of the empty boat is, at least in part, what your cost in this will be, will be the same, whether or not there was another pilot, whether or not there was another captain, whether or not somebody did it on pur purpose or by mistake whether or not there was intention or not, you still have the same cost. So why treat any boat as anything other than empty? Why presume cause or intention when it's only adding to your own pain and suffering? So anyway, that line in the last poem reminded me of the empty boat story. So even though I said it's poetry time, it's still me. So it's always teaching time. Sorry. So I just opened a page 86, maybe a number that you had on, on your mind tonight. But for me, it was just random. Again, the cloud should know be by now. And this is uh, Michael Connor in Red Pine. This is hearing the gibbons call in Pa Gorge. Hearing the gibbons call in Pa Gorge. <laughs> As another boating one. As I lean on my oar, gazing at the cloud line, purity emerges, deep and lonely, from the gorge. When the mind doesn't have anything on it, there's no sorrow inherent in repeated calls. They bear the dew where every peak is distant, dangle in space, where a slice of moon shines bright. Whoever hears it like this can finish a poem by dawn. <sighs> That's Wen Chao. Hmm. There's a longer one, that's why I'm flipping. I don't think I'd like to overstay my welcome by reading a longer one. So, we read Living in Poverty. Oh, I like this one. This is Lost Cranes. I think it's the one I was thinking of. <sighs> I just thought I'd take a moment and smile.
is still taping, it's not a photo. This is Lost Greens. And the pair of cranes suddenly flew off, their pure notes heard no more. Perhaps they're far away, obliged to seek immortal company, or close by, idly anxious to avoid the chicken flock. The lake bank quiet, Water watchings over, the courtyard empty. They've finished the cloud dance. All that's left are some old tracks, like ancient writing, pressed in the patterns of moss. That's tea on. Page 101. So also to you on page 100. I just saw opposite page 101. Maybe we should change the view a little. Give you the scary view of the... Uh, and maybe page 100. Maybe I'll give you the view that you were all expecting. not true. We're still here. Together. Uh, see if I can balance the phone here. Oh, that sort of worked. Not too bad. You guys are balanced on the faucet. <laughs> so we're on page two on page 100. There's our red pine book, which I might have switched from by now if we're in the library, somewhere civilized, but you made us meet in the secret crying place. So I'm clothed on the floor of the shower. It's very cold in the middle of the night, just as you're curled up in your child's bed or hiding in the garage or stomping around on the deck under a sliver of moon while children sleep in bedrooms on the other side of the house. But here we are with poetry thousands, hundreds of years old. This is also Chi Yuan, same as the last. And this is uh, in praise of Chan, Master Wang Yu, who cares for the bonnet monkeys around his mountain studio. <sighs> this is one of those poems that I feel like if you read, or had read to you. could just be the focus of one's practice for dozens of years. And I just calligraph this poem hanging on a scroll in front of where you meditate or where you pass when you're coming from the market to the kitchen. Just have it suffused in your being, have your being relate to it over and over from all of its many moods. I 
that's just what I think, and I'm probably no poet. From tree after tree, in the undisturbed courtyard, the fruits dropped on the frost. They even love entering the thatched hall to listen to Dharma. How is it other species know courtesy and limits? Coming in each time, they sit opposite one another on the meditation benches. read a couple mountain poems without much discussion or much planned discussion. Hello. Remember if you feel like the world is ending. There are at least two worlds in this world. There is the world, and there is your inner world. This world. is subject to your practice. This is from a section of the book called, I think, 18? No, it's 28 Mountain Poems. And they're all, uh, I think they're all four lines. Yeah, so I'll just read a few. Snow besieges my plank door. I crowd the stove at night. Although this form exists, it seems as if it doesn't. I have no idea where the months have gone. Every time I turn around, another year on earth is over. A tiny hut in a world of plants, a bed of stone, a thatched roof shrine, a closed doorway like Vimil Lakirti's. Don't ask about the bunch in front or back. A solitary winter lantern casts a feeble shadow. Winds blow through my flimsy hut and covers me with snow. I remember sitting cross-legged on Wu Thai, a makeshift door amid 10,000-year-old ice. A hundred thousand worlds are flowers in the sky. A single mind and body is moonlight on the water. Once the cunning ends and information stops, at that moment there is no place for thought.
Late at night, I sit alone and work on Deadwood Zen. I stir the lifeless ashes the fire won't relight. Suddenly, I hear the tower chime resound. Its single sound of clarity fills the winter sky. The spring has come again, the snow has finally stopped. The crescent moon and leafless trees look thinner than before. At night, I push my window open and gaze into space. Beyond my pillared eaves spreads a sky of stars. I follow my impulsive feet wherever they might go. My body is a pine tree surrounded by the snow. Sometimes I simply stand beside a flowing stream. Sometimes I chase a drifting cloud past another peak. Now this one starts with the phrase, my long white hair. So I'm going to skip that one. It doesn't apply to me. We're on page 129 now. The mountains stand unmoving just the way they are. All day they let the clouds roll out and roll back in. Even though red dust is countless layers deep, not a single speck reaches my thatched hut. So here again we have the red dust. So I'll read that one again because you have a little bit more understanding of the red dust. So. <sighs> The mountains stand unmoving just the way they are. All day they let the clouds roll out and roll back in. Even though red dust is countless layers deep, not a single speck reaches my thatched hut. Deep among ten thousand peaks, I sit alone, cross-legged. A solitary thought fills my empty mind. My body is the moon that lights the winter sky. In rivers and in lakes are only its reflections. dust. Hmm. One thing to notice is uh, when they talk about the clouds in these, they often refer to um, peripatetic monks and the like. Seekers who oh, come for a visit and move on. So when we hear the cloud. Being. Brought to life in one of these poems. We can understand it as. These monks that. Uh, seem to make it to the mountain but don't stay and move along so 
So this one has clouds, so we'll see how we do. Resting at my open window, I gaze out at mountains. A thousand peaks of blue and purple rise above the pines. Without a thought or care, white clouds come and go. So utterly accepting, so totally relaxed. Okay, connecting so that if nothing else you don't feel alone. So this is a, a poem entitled Written on a Summer Day in the City. Monk neighbors on three sides, a wall on the fourth. No passage for the wind to blow me, a puff of cool. If some year I left here, where would I go? To a cell of stone among blue cliffs and red sunset skies. It's the drifting clouds. <laughs> uh, here we are with another. This is called Don't Ask. It's one in a series of poems. Don't ask if I've ceased wanting anything. We all know the simile of the drifting clouds. Yes, we do. Excess wouldn't fit the precepts. Take what comes and you're never in doubt. How happy that worthy yen. Even the sage Confucius was poor. Once you've passed the age of understanding, stop trying to change destiny's course. My expectation is that this is backwards to you because of this weird Facebook Live camera situation. But if I flip it backwards to help, it doesn't help. So I think I'm going to bring our shared poetry hour to a close. And remind you that if you are curled up, fearful, and crying, uh, perhaps in your tub, you don't have to be alone even there. You can remember that there's a community here for you, maybe even there for you in their own darkened corner. And there is poetry. And this is real. The sort of poems that I was reading are poems that not only are real, but they point to an everlasting reality, an immutable ecstasy. And so, I'm going to end this cast so that I can keep checking in on people. Uh, and there was in the vicinity of 20 people reaching out on a variety of platforms. And I remind you that you can do the same.
text messaging or Facebook messaging or emailing or what have you. So I don't want to stay in here too long in case somebody's reaching out there and I can't read you back. But I would like to encourage you to do the same for those in your community. You know, be proactive, reach out. Remind them that you're there. Don't wait for them to ask for help. Offer help. Offer an ear. Offer a shoulder. Offer a lollipop. Offer a ride. Offer a cup of coffee. Offer a poem. Thank you. There is love. There is love. There is love. Here is love.